This week's episode of Plastic Weekly is brought to you by Skip Bainey and the rest of my Patreon supporters who help make this show happen by donating a dollar or two each week. Skip, knowing that this project means something to folks in the southern states is a huge deal for me. I can't thank you enough for showing your support. This week's episode is something a bit different. Plastic Weekly is all about talking to smart people and getting them to help make me smarter. But sometimes I feel like I need to say something, and this is one of those times. I'm not going to do this too often, and I don't plan on weighing in on contentious issues. I'd way rather everybody take time to think about tough problems and sort them out together. What I'm going to talk about today is more of a comment on where I hope things will go, and I hope that talking about it will raise the bar a little. If you don't like the sound of my voice, then delete this episode right now, switch over to something else, because this one is all me. But if you do stick around and listen through the entire episode, make sure you give it some thought and then share your own thoughts on the topic. Otherwise, this is going to be a lot of hot air for no reason. But before we dig into this, I wanted to give a quick shout out to an event near me here in Southern Ontario. It's getting to be that Christmas season, which is a pretty emotional season in general and makes you think a lot about your family and the memories associated with them, whether those are good or bad. I'm pretty well as lucky as I can get with my intact nuclear upper middle class family, no serious health issues in myself for the ones I love, no financial struggles for anyone, nothing that's got us against the ropes. I mean, we're still people. We struggle with things from time to time. My family is more full of anxiety than like a kennel of puppies in a thunderstorm, but we're doing all right. So as much as I can't relate to a lot of the struggles that are experienced by my friends or neighbors, this year I'm trying to be more conscious of the little things I can do to help others. A friend of mine has a nephew named Ludovic who's living with Duchenne muscular dystrophy, which means while I'm trying to be strong enough to climb V8 or do 20 push-ups in a row, Ludovic is trying to be strong enough to walk, or just to stand up, or just to be able to breathe. It turns out I'm lucky enough to have a body that does what I want it to do. So next Thursday, I'm going to use that body on November 30th to go down to Grand River Rocks in Kitchener, Ontario. Uh, Ludovic's uh, family member, Max, a friend of mine, has put together a fun competition from 6 p.m. to 8.30 p.m., to raise money for Ludovic and his family. So we're going to climb, make some new friends, and support a little dude who could really use it. The event costs 15 bucks plus a day pass, and you'll be eligible to win a bunch of great prizes, including ropes and gear to get you excited for next season. So next Thursday, November 30th at Grand River Rocks in Kitchener, 6 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. I'm making the schlep from Toronto. Let me know if you want a carpool. I hope I'll see you there. Live streaming isn't a perk that people are just pleasantly surprised to hear that you're offering for your upcoming competition. Live streaming is now something that people expect from any mid-tier or high-tier comp. And while that costs some money, it's the greatest thing to happen to your comp in a while. Not just because your first place qualifier's distant family can watch the event from their summer home in Sarasota, but because more of your members can watch the event, and your event will gain more exposure, your gym will gain more exposure, and most importantly, your sponsors will gain more exposure. Competition climbing has a lot of problems, but the biggest one for organizers and athletes is the lack of sponsorship dollars available. And the only way to grow the amount of money we can make is by proving that there are eyeballs paying attention. All of our gyms are limited by the local fire code to a few hundred spectators at most. So broadcasting our events is the only way to increase our number of viewers and create extra value for the companies who support us. So hosting a live stream is a great first step. And it can take a few events to figure out how to do it well in your facility or how to work with the broadcast company you use. But now that live streams are a little more prevalent, I want to make sure we're raising the bar on our broadcasts. We should be trying to make sure that our broadcasts provide the best viewing experience possible and make sure the viewers who start to watch our streams don't turn it off. We want to entertain them so much that they share it with their friends. We need to do these things really well to make comp climbing a viable sport going forward. So in this inaugural episode of First Descent, I'm going to list the six things that are required to call something a top-tier stream. Some of these are a matter of attitude. 
Some of them are a matter of technology and some of them just cost more money. But these are the next milestones that broadcast should be hoping to achieve. So let's figure out how to do it and then make it happen. Number one, if there's a climber on the wall, show the climber on the screen. This sounds obvious, but unfortunately it isn't. Whether it's cutting to a shot of the commentators or switching over to a live interview with an athlete that just finished their climbing, this cardinal sin happens not only at little local events, but at gosh darn IFSC World Cups. And that's just ridiculous. The NFL would never cut from a live play to talk to a coach. No director would ever switch the cameras to look at the commentators while a golf ball was in midair during the Masters tournament. From here on out, if a climbing event ever cuts away from a climber in action, it should be seen as an act of disrespect towards the climber and the viewers and the sport. We all know that climbing events can be long, especially if we're talking about a qualifying round or a semifinal round in bouldering or difficulty. Maybe we're complacent and have started to think it's okay to look away for a bit. And yes, the viewer absolutely has the right to stop paying attention, but we can't decide what they can and can't watch. Each viewer is rooting for a different climber, and there's always going to be someone out there who is interested at any given moment. And this isn't to say the commentators can't go off on a tangent or that we can't interview athletes during climbing. Both of those things can be informative and entertaining, but the camera has got to stay on the climbing. So what about when you're showing an IFSC finals format and there's a man and a woman on the wall at the same time? Well, this is where you kind of have to start talking about values. There's no reason one camera can't watch both men's one and women's one if those problems are set side by side. Maybe that's not how you set events at your gym. Maybe you spread problems out. Maybe it's because you don't want fall zones to be an issue. Maybe you like different angles happening at the same time. Maybe the geometry of your wall is so dramatic that two problems near each other aren't actually visible together from the angle uh, for the audience of the gym. Well, it's time to consider the bigger audience. It's almost certain that for any mid or top tier event, more people will be watching your event from their computers than from inside your gym. There is definitely more opportunity to grow your online audience than your on-site audience. And because of that, I think the experience of your online viewers should be a priority over what you may have done in the past. Get your root setters and crew together and start figuring out a layout that makes it possible for the men and women to be climbing adjacent problems. If you can do that, then you'll be able to show every moment of the event with as little as one mobile camera. And maybe you're asking, well, how do I make sure we don't miss any action when it's a qualifying round and there are five men and five women on the wall at the same time? (laughs) Yeah, that's a good question. I've seen events use multiple streams uh, where each stream covers maybe two problems, but all of the streams share the same audio and commentary. Um, If you've got a director working for you, they might be able to switch between cameras and catch as much action as possible. But honestly, I don't watch the qualifiers or semis because they're long as hell and not very entertaining. When I watch sports, I want to see the best going head to head, not hundreds of scrubs just chuffing their way through the starting moves of a World Cup qualifier. I'd personally prefer moving your resources away from showing these rounds and using them to make the finals broadcast better. More people are interested in finals, and that's where the potential for growth is. The general public will never be interested in watching 20 hours of Munich bouldering qualifiers, so don't bother paying a crew to work all that overtime. Use your money where it'll be valued. I can understand that people may disagree, especially when we're talking about youth events. Yeah, for the kids stuff, it's generally parents and coaches watching, so sure, go for it. And if you stumble upon a great way to show lots of climbers all at once, let us know. Number two, make your stream easy to find. Different communities rally around different platforms. If I want to know what's going on in politics, I'm going to hop on Twitter. If I'm trying to watch a CSGO LAN, I'll check out Twitch or Reddit. If I want to fall down a rabbit hole of memes, I'll get on Instagram. And if I want to talk with my close circle of friends, then I'm going to find them on Facebook Messenger. It makes life a lot easier when I know where my community lives so I can easily find the stuff I'm looking for. On the other hand, it makes life really damn hard when I want to watch a climbing event and I have to pluck some weird URL out of an old Instagram post made by the host gym's head root setter. That is no way to reach your audience. 
Comp Climbing Media is mostly shared via Instagram, and a lot of streams are broadcasting over YouTube, and that means you should be on there too. If your broadcasting company is offering personalized hosting solutions, make sure they know that you want your event broadcast live on YouTube. Don't let them put out your content on some unique portal that we all need a special URL to get to. At any given time, there are thousands of climbers browsing YouTube from around the world, and there's a very good chance that your stream will be suggested to them just based on previous climbing videos that they've watched. Don't miss the opportunity to get these people watching your stream. As a viewer, I don't always know of every single competition happening around the world, but I'll definitely be on YouTube a couple times a day, and if I see a live climbing competition is happening right now, I'm going to click on it and watch. And that's one more viewer for your event who you never met and who never saw your advertising. And for your sake, don't just be on YouTube. Host the event on your gym's channel. If you don't have a channel, make a channel. If I hear about a live competition at, say, the Windsor Rock Gym, I'm going to hop on YouTube and search for Windsor Rock Gym. If your event isn't hosted on your channel, it's just going to make it harder to find. It'll be tagged under other things. So make it easy. Make it obvious. You'll be rewarded with more viewers. Number three, make the timer visible. Sometimes it's been said that the climbers aren't competing against each other. They're competing against the root setters. I think that's a neat turn of phrase, but I'd add to it that they're also competing against the clock. Any climber in finals knows that they can send the problem in front of them, but can they do it in five minutes? From a viewer's perspective, the struggle of the athlete is only put into context if we know how much time is left on the clock. Without knowing the time, we don't know the consequence of that mistaken beta or that long rest. We also don't get to savor the tension and sweetness of getting both hands on the finish with only two seconds remaining. Without the clock on screen, you're throwing away the pressure cooker that creates the opportunity for last minute winning goals and touchdowns. Without the clock, you're trying to create a hero without a villain. Now, most of us aren't familiar with broadcast technology, so we might not know how to make this work. I know for sure that I don't know how to create a clock graphic that is somehow like synced to the official timer. I've got no flippin' idea. But climbing is scrappy, so let's find a workaround. And this idea actually comes from a World Cup event where they aimed a camera at one of the official timers, zoomed in all the way, and then inset that video image onto the screen. It was kind of funny because they applied <laughs> like a blur around the edges so it looked like some really old school special effects of a floating alarm clock on the screen. But what matters is that it worked. The broadcast team didn't need to work with the judges to control the timer and there was no specialty graphics or programming needed. They just had a camera pointed at a clock. And although I'm not experienced in broadcast technology, I already know how to inset one video feed on top of another in some different types of streaming software, so I know firsthand that this is an easy fix. Maybe some bigger companies will soon be able to like develop a sweet ESPN quality clock graphic, but until then, this works. And like I said before, having the clock visible is the only way that comp climbing actually becomes exciting. It's the only way people will feel the emotions that only swell up when you know it's down to the wire. So do whatever you can. Show the clock. Number four, lighting. This should be a quick one. I know that it's really cool to walk into a gym and be impressed by a dark atmosphere with loud music and trippy colored lights illuminating the wall. It's a new environment for gym goers and it's really fun for a minute, but colored lighting is a disaster on camera. If you are broadcasting your comp, use white lights. First of all, cameras just need a lot of light. Everything will look better on screen if you make the walls as bright as possible. Secondly, I want you to consider the difference in viewing experience between one of your gym regulars who watches the comp on site in the gym versus someone who's never been to your gym watching the event online. The camera's perspective is further away than your audience, most likely, so things will be smaller on the screen. Holds will be smaller and harder to see. Unlike your regulars, they may not have seen these holds before. Also, video images are two-dimensional, unlike the three-dimensional view your on-site audiences get to enjoy. So when you add all that together, it is significantly more difficult 
For a viewer online to see and understand each root or boulder, it's harder for them to judge angles, to see textures, to identify in-cuts, or notice small screw-ons. And that's the entire point of watching the climb. This gets even harder if you wash your walls with colored light. I understand that it's initially striking, but it's terrible for broadcasting. If you're not convinced, watch some recent events from the USA Climbing National Bouldering Series, whatever it's called. They had strong climbers, they had great root setters. I'm sure the roots were great, but it was hard to watch. So use white light. Number five, start showing ads. You're already in the habit of putting your sponsor's logos on your poster and giving them a shout out on Instagram and plastering their logos on your walls. It's the logical next step to start offering to show their logo or ads on your stream. This can be as small as overlaying your sponsor's logos in a row along the bottom of the screen or rotating through their logos in a top corner or something like that. Or if you want to go big, you've probably seen the 15 second ads that Technic and eGrips and some others show at the USA Climbing National events. And there's no reason that you can't do the same. All this requires some coordination with your broadcast provider. They'll need the image files of your sponsors in advance, as well as time to sort out how you want everything to be laid out on the screen. If you're gonna show mid-roll ads, you'll need to coordinate between the officials on the ground and the broadcast director to make sure there's a gap between climbers to show those ads. But all of this is definitely worth the added value that you can start to present to your sponsors. I wouldn't ask for more from a sponsor for your first year of running ads on a live stream, but I'd be bringing it to their attention that you're trying it out and I'd send them a clip of it after the event so they can see what you're doing. Long term, figuring out how to give sponsors more screen time is a huge deal for not just your event, but for the industry altogether. So start looking into it now. Number six, persistent on-screen scoring. This is my last requirement for making your broadcast a top tier show in the modern era. It's also the most difficult one in terms of technology, event coordination, and also in terms of how hard scoring is within climbing by itself. But it's something we need to figure out, so let's get on it. My argument is pretty simple. Your broadcast exists to entertain and inform. A viewer should be able to turn on your stream and have a near instant understanding of the state of the competition. If I tune in as the first climbers come out onto problem number three of a bouldering finals, I shouldn't have to wait until the end of all six climbers before I know who's in the lead. Without knowing the score, I won't understand the importance of how the climbers perform on that problem. I won't be able to get excited about my favorite climber trying to hold on to their lead. Just like trying to watch without knowing how much time is left, watching without the score removes important context for the viewer. Finals rounds should have a simple table on one side of the screen showing the current scores, while semifinals and qualifiers could go the way of racing and use a scrolling ticker along the bottom that shows all of the climber's current results. Now, the ticker doesn't currently exist in any way that I can think of, but I know that a service like Crimp has a pretty decent live scoring system, which can be viewed easily on a smartphone screen. And that means if you end up using Crimp or a similar service for your event, it's easy to overlay a narrow web browser window showing the results from your scoring service. So as the viewer, the right fifth of the screen would be a column of scores. I know Crimp or uh, Crimp.rocks, however you pronounce it, they're a scoring service from Singapore. I know they offer an API for a scoring overlay for live streams, but I think it's a full screen graphic that you wouldn't want to have on the screen all the time. Uh, It would block the climbing. Maybe they'll develop something along the lines of what I'm thinking, something that would fit in the right fifth of the screen. But for now, I've managed to make the overlaid narrow browser window work with my own software. So I know it's possible. And while this stuff is possible, I know that scoring is one of climbing's biggest challenges. Everything I just proposed assumes you've got a team of judges all manned with smartphones, let alone judges that know what they're doing. It also assumes you're using a system based on tops and bonuses. If you're using like the new USA bouldering scoring system, good luck finding a public scoring app. Scoring on screen is full of issues we need to solve, but I think it's time to start figuring it out. And if you're a viewer, start asking for it. It's kind and gentle of us to appreciate whatever live streams we can get. 
As a viewer, we know they're expensive, and since we're not paying to watch, we can't claim that we are owed a live stream. But as a sport, the only way to sustainably support competitions and competitors is to make the viewing experience so good that more people start watching. Not just climbers, but non-climbers. Seriously, how many people watching the Super Bowl actually play football regularly? We can't just use live streams to entertain our own community. Live streams need to reach out, entice strangers, and expand our community. And I think these six requirements, number one, always showing the climber, two, making sure your stream is easy to find, three, showing the timer, four, not using bad lighting, five, showing that we're serious about advertising, and six, making scores easy to see are all the ways that we can start fostering a bigger audience. That's it for this episode of Plastic Weekly. Thanks for listening to me ramble for a bit. Plastic Weekly is presented and produced by me, Tyler Norton. If you like this episode, please leave a review in your podcast app or consider donating a dollar to each week to my Patreon at patreon.com slash plasticweekly. Make sure you visit plasticweekly.com to weigh in on this conversation. I do want to hear what you think. Maybe it's not six requirements, maybe it's seven. There's a lot to talk about when it comes to this, so I hope you'll join in. If you want to get in touch with me, you can leave a comment at PlasticWeekly.com and you can follow us on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook. You can send me an email to Tyler at PlasticWeekly.com with your comments, concerns, questions, compliments. Just tell me you're out there somewhere. Good luck to everyone competing this weekend, including at Quebec's stop of the CEC Open National Series. We'll be thinking about you. Talk to you next week. (laughs) 